So this week on the Procurement Conversation, we're having a CPO conversation with Peter Smith. Peter Smith, procurement expert, author of Bad Buying and co-author of Procurement with Purpose. Peter, thanks for joining me today. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Rich. So Peter, I thought it might be good to start off with why procurement? How did you get into procurement in the first place? Uh, like many of us in the profession, it was an accident. I'm sorry to say it wasn't, you know, it wasn't my ambition from the age of three or anything. Um, I was working at Mars after university, went through the graduate trainee scheme, thought I was heading probably for marketing, strangely enough. And I literally got tapped on the shoulder by the senior HR guy um, saying, uh, you need to get your application in for this job in, in purchasing, as Mars called it. And I said, I hadn't even thought about that. And he said, oh, we think you should. Um, so there's a couple of theories there. One is they were desperate to get me out of the job I was doing, which is a sort of office sales support job, which I don't think I was very good at, genuinely. Um, but also the sort of second in command in purchasing was a guy who played a lot of tennis, which I did too. So there's sort of about 10 of us at Mars who were keen tennis players in the office. So he knew me from that. And I think, uh, you know, liked the look of my forehand volley. So <laughs> thought he would uh, he would get me get me into purchasing. Um, so I, I did. And what I can honestly say is within weeks, I thought, yeah, this is this is great. Um, I'd done different things at, at Mars already at the age of 25. Um, but I, I just thought procurement combined the, the sort of intellectual analytical side of things because I'm a yeah. mathematician statistician by training um but it wasn't sort of sitting in the corner with your, your computer or your spreadsheets like the accountants or the uh, <laughs> or the software people um you got out and met people and and negotiated and there's a lot of interpersonal stuff in procurement and I think still think now many years later it's a, a great area because of that combination of different skills that we need to to do it well yeah do you think the interpersonal side has has increased over the years, or do you think it's sort of it's, it's decreased a bit? Um, no, I, I think our understanding of how important it is has grown in the profession. Um, I think one one thing in that, if I look back, I started in manufacturing, but then moved on to three CPO procurement director roles, where actually in all three, one in government, two in the private sector, um, where services were a bigger part of what we procured right. rather than goods i mean they're all you know one was financial services one was business services one was government department of social security um and i think when when you're buying services procurement is dealing with generally a wider range of stake internal stakeholders yeah and often more difficult stakeholders so while i had some <laughs> some interesting run-ins with the factory manager at mars um, you know, I only had a handful of stakeholders as as head of packaging buying. It was the senior production guys, mm. basically guys, and not many ladies in those days. Um, whereas you'll know if if you're if you're the professional services category manager or IT services or even yeah. facilities travel, all of those services categories, we're we're dealing with lots of users and budget holders and stakeholders internally, as well as all the external dimension of suppliers. And I think those um, softer skills, let's say, are just absolutely essential when it comes to handling handling those stakeholders. We we all know that. Mm. <laughs> so so I think that that's the increased focus or the increased importance of services procurement is possibly what's driven that um, yeah. sort of change in views of what skills we need. You mentioned your, your tennis there. So your, your tennis improved, uh, I'm assuming, when you work here at Mars. And, uh, and and what else is it you do in your in your spare time? Yeah, I don't play tennis anymore. I try and keep fit and go to the gym and cycle a bit. Um, I'm into music. Um, went to Reading Festival recently for the Brilliant. 17th year running. We don't camp, I should say. We we commute. Uh, stay out of the. Okay. Uh, 16 year olds running rampant on the campsites which you do hear about but but we love music i play the bass guitar fairly badly in oh, wow. plus. um and uh i i do most of the cooking in the house now and i i do sort of collect and drink wine oh lovely yeah i, I can attest that the camping at reading festival is is quite disgusting actually <laughs> yes i know i never did that our theory is it's um it's actually government sponsored to make the kids think when they go off to university to their university digs 
they go, well, this, this is pretty bad, but actually it's a lot better than the campsites at Reading. So it sort of changes their expectations of life away from their parents. That's how okay, it goes. Yeah, 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 totally. I, I did notice actually this year that the uh, there was a, a drive to try and get people to reuse more of their equipment at the campsite, which I think is it's probably a, a segue into the, uh, the procurement with purpose uh, section yeah. that we'll probably talk about now. Yeah, it didn't, didn't work, I don't think, from the pictures I've seen. But it, it's difficult. It actually does, um, on a serious note, it, it sort of encapsulates some of the big issues we face in terms of the environment and, and the circular economy and waste and all that sort of thing. Because if you're a 16-year-old girl, or boy for that matter, but uh, and you've got a tent that costs you £29.99, and you've got a choice. You're either going to pack it up and walk with whatever else you've got to carry home for two miles back to the station or, or where your mum's picking you up. Or you leave the tent, which is probably in a pretty bad way anyway. Or you just leave it in the field. Yeah. I, and particularly if they're leaving late at night or first thing in the morning. I, I totally understand why that happens. And I think that's that's where there is a role for... Um, for both sort of persuading people to act differently in terms of purpose and sustainability, but also the the nudges that that government yeah. and other other regulators, other bodies can give, and and also you know pure laws regulations. Mm. Um, so I don't know if if there was a deposit that you paid yeah, yeah, thirty yeah. quid for putting your tent up, and you got it back at the gate when you showed you you brought it out again. Yeah then there wouldn't be tents left behind. So, yeah. you, you know, we, we're going to have to do more things like that. And, and I mean, this is going to be a, a horrible winter for millions of people with energy prices and so yeah. on. But equally, perhaps energy and food and things have been too cheap in some ways. We, we've, we haven't thought about what we're, we're using in terms yeah. of natural resources. So, um, so we have to manage, manage the transition um but yeah we we need to look after resources better water is another thing i mean i i i should have said i grow vegetables fruit and vegetables in the garden as well so i have about six or seven water butts around the garden that collect water when it rains but of course they got emptied pretty damn early this summer because it was so dry yeah uh, yeah so when you have to carry water in cans around you do appreciate uh you know how lucky we are to have running water and so on but we need to look after these things yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, I think I I agree. There's the sort of the consumption economy has has sort of grown massively over, well, definitely over the last fifty years, but especially in the last twenty years or so. And and one of the issues I think we have with some of the uh, the sort of sustainable procurement is actually ultimately as a society we need to consume less stuff, and our our business is geared towards making more profit and growing all the time. So it's it's difficult to sort of square that that circle, really, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Absolutely. Um, and I'd be interested to see what happens with business travel, for instance, mm. because that obviously dropped dramatically through COVID. I'm sure it's picking up again, but I'd hope most organisations are looking hard at what's really necessary Yeah, and, and seeing where you can cut back. And and this is where, um, yeah, my, my latest book, Procurement with Purpose, Look at, looking at things like like greenwashing as they call it mm. and you know there's lots of organizations talking about offsetting their carbon emissions well a lot of the offset programs frankly are a bit dodgy and mm. i question whether they really deliver anything but the first starting point should be well don't you know don't offset your business travel related emissions see if you can reduce your business travel no. That should be your first step, mm. not just looking at, well, we'll plant a few more trees and then then our chief exec can continue flying around the world. Um, and this is where there's a lot of uh, hypocritical people out there, not just in the business world, but but actually in, in the music world, in the, in the world of celebrity and even royalty mentioning no names. But um, mm. so, yeah. I mean, do, you, do, you think that, do you think industry is rising to the challenges particularly procurement or do you think it's sort of uh yeah not not really i i think there is a real desire i mean i haven't spoken to any procurement person in the last couple of years even sort of off the record or after a couple of beers who who said you know i really don't care about all this 
the sustainable procurement stuff. I think I think people do care. I mean, we all want to. I think we all want to feel proud about what we're doing for forty hours a week, and proud of the organisations I work that we work for. Um, but it's just when that runs into the hard reality sometimes. So, you know, one question is, well, do you would you be prepared to pay more to buy a, a product or a service that's that's greener? Yeah. So, you know, option A is is a hundred pounds and it comes with this level of emissions or whatever. Option B is 110 pounds, but it has much lower emissions. So are you prepared to pay more? And it's it's those sort of questions that are are difficult to answer, mm. to be honest. I mean, I mean, the UK government is um, trying to address some of that, building in social value, which which is a strange terminology because it actually covers more than what I would see as the social side of of yeah. procurement as purpose. Yeah. It covers environmental issues as well, um, but actually telling people to have an evaluation factor in the tender evaluations. Of, of at least 10 percent that considers these issues means that you know that that in effect means we are prepared to pay a bit more if we're getting better social value mm. uh in, in whatever way that might come across um and i'm seeing some private sector organizations starting to do that but probably in some ways the, the public sector in the uk is is leading the way there uh, yeah. so that that's the sort of thing that's interesting because i'm i'm starting to when I do presentations and I'm doing a couple of big conferences in October, I've been talking last year or two about, in, in effect, what does procurement with purpose mean and the basics of how do you do it? How do you write a strategy? Yeah. How do you look at what the priorities should be? How do you start putting it in place? But but now I think in my presentations, I'm trying to move on to the real implementation. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, you've written a sustainable procurement strategy. You know, looks pretty good. Eight out of ten could be improved a bit. But what are you actually doing? Yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. part of that is things like, yes, you need to collect data. Not arguing about that for for a moment. You need to collect data. You need to look at uh, scope three emissions. You might want to get your suppliers to sign up to human rights charters and modern slavery charters and all this good stuff. Uh, but collecting data does not save a single kilogram of emissions. No. And, no, no. and, and having a hundred statements on modern slavery, you know, ticked off by your suppliers, uh, doesn't actually in itself achieve anything. It might, mm. it might be a necessary condition for success, but it's certainly not a necessary and sufficient condition, as the math mathematicians would say. Yeah. So so I think we've got to turn the the good intentions now into real action. I think that's been the problem, is it? I think, you know, as you say, everyone, everyone feels strongly about that ne something needs to happen, but they're not always too clear about what it actually is that needs to happen. And it it is a complex, it's, it's a complex piece. And actually, there's sometimes there's unintended consequences of doing taking one course of action over another course of action. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you think? So I know in in, in the procurement with purpose, there was a section about, you know, COVID. Will will it help or hinder? Mm. Is it side, will it will it cause it to be sidelined or to thrive how how do you think it has affected uh procurement with purpose i think it's 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 still been a bit of both i mean mm. in, in some ways it's set back uh things like plastics you know single-use plastics yeah. all the ppe um and the nhs is just beginning to get its head around how to how to address that now um but in other ways you'd like to think it made us realize how how vulnerable we all are and the interface yeah. with the natural world you know where did the uh, where did covid come from in the first place um and i think combined with ukraine and the threat of china it's really making organizations think hard about about supply chain resilience yeah and globalization and and, and all of those things now now that's in a sense wider than the the than just the procurement with purpose issue, much, much wider. But I think that's actually the biggest challenge for procurement in the next few years, potentially, is, is for many organisations changing the whole procurement strategy that they've been running under for the last 20 years, which has been outsourcing, um, yeah. shoring, low-cost country sourcing, all, all that sort of thing. 
and now organizations are thinking about well do we need to to uh, near shore as they call it do we need to bring things back in house do we need a more resilient supply base is it sensible to to keep rationalizing our supply base so we've only got you know one supplier for this and two suppliers for that maybe we need more suppliers for mm. when things do go wrong and the sustainability purpose issues are sort of caught up in that but they're, they're part of that bigger picture i think yeah um you know the the danger is when if if things get really difficult in the next year or two that people do revert to well i just need to keep the factory running or i just need to keep our business yeah. running and, and ultimately and I, i've said this i was taught at mars in the early days you know the number one priority in procurement at mars was keeping the factory running yeah uh, and i got no <laughs> no brownie points and no bonuses for for amazing supply strategies if the bounty line ran out of milk powder you, you know yeah. that, that yeah. was the fundamental and then cost management would be number two on on your list so um so we can never forget that in procurement and and there is a danger i think that the next couple of years some of the some of the procurement with purpose issues might might take a slight back seat in some organizations mm. it's difficult to say is it? I, I feel this year at one the last couple of years the the really extreme weather events we're starting to see actually it will you know you feel like the public might actually start to get behind some of this stuff and you know sort of it's difficult isn't it because when when the cost of living is hitting as well you, you sort of have to do yeah. that but yeah you know there's there's certain areas where they're having a very very difficult time and the you know, look at pakistan and even south yes. africa and uh and the states and europe over the last uh last couple of months there's been some really really extreme weather and that's uh that's yeah. making people start to think actually this this isn't great you know we're we yeah but something. it but it's but it's very difficult isn't it because mm. you're asking say people in the uk to make some sacrifices and and if they are well informed they they look at it and go well that's fine but china is opening i think it's about 50 new coal fired power stations this year you know wow. it's it's one a week mm. um so you know i might turn my thermostat down because it saves me money but yeah. if you're asking me to make sort of personal sacrifices for the good of the the planet it it's difficult you know until really everybody pulls together yeah, uh, which is why things like COP are are really important, and uh, international cooperation is is so vital. You know, it's no good one country doing things on their own, really. So no. we'll have to see. We'll have to see. Yeah. So your other project was the uh, bad buying. Are, are you uh, is bad buying <laughs> two being uh, being written at the moment, or any other? I uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, there must be a, a fair uh, amount of content coming out of the. Uh, well, I, I have a file sitting about two two feet away from me as we speak, which is <laughs> which is full of newspaper cuttings and, and printouts of websites, which is the the bad buying two file. Um, it was interesting. I talked to Penguin about it, and and bad buying one has done has done okay. Hasn't set mm. the world on fire from Penguin's point of view. You know, it's done okay. Um, and I said, well, I could write. You know, I could write a book just about pandemic procurement about the PPE and test and trace and 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 the vaccine there's some positives in there as well mm. and uh, the lady sort of publisher of penguins her view was once we were through the pandemic people wouldn't particularly want to read 200 pages about what went wrong yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. which is a, a fair point I I don't know so yeah I I don't know if if there's a bad buying too maybe maybe I'll just do something, put it out as an e ebook or something. The the more difficult decision actually is procurement with purpose because the problem is it's such a a, a moving picture. Almost mm. every almost every chapter, um, it's been out coming up to a year now. And my yeah. fear is, once we get to two years, you'll read the chapter on on climate change and go, well, you know, that's out of date. That's changed, and mm. um, some of the companies we were holding up as good examples will have been exposed as actually being terrible in practice so so i think there's an argument that um yeah that i should put some time and effort maybe into a a second edition of that or maybe even a, a totally new book I, I don't know but mm. it's um it's hard work and you don't i mean it's it's sat very satisfying you certainly mm. don't write books to make money 
oh, you don't write this sort of book to me, buddy. Um, My wife's an author, so I, I sort of... Uh, oh, I really? The, the finance is behind it all, but... <laughs> Oh, interesting. Mm. Yeah, I discovered my best friend from childhood, who I haven't seen for 35 years until this summer, um, has had a career in business and a side career as a thriller writer. Ah. He was telling me some of his stories about how mean people are in terms of paying uh, paying for e-books. Right. You know, that he sells e-books for like one ninety nine, and people go... Even if they liked his previous book, they go, "Oh, I'm not paying one ninety nine. You know, if if you let me have it free, I'll have it." So, uh, anyway, um, yeah, I don't know. I think that there may be something more on procurement as purpose at some point. Yeah, and do you, I mean, do you think that the have things been getting worse, or do you think the the mistakes are just spoken about a bit more often? You know, things like you've you've got the good law project that bring bad buying to light. Is that is that driving, or do you think you know, or is it just that actually there's there's more complexity in what we're buying now, or yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, it tends to be the public sector that gets exposed. My personal mm. view is there's just as much bad buying in the private sector, actually, but you just don't hear about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, very quiet. Uh, I think the public sector, there is more scrutiny than ever, which is sort of good. Mm. Uh, I think you're right, there is more more complexity. I think suppliers are, are more switched on as well. So back when I was first working in government in the 90s as a procurement director, then I did a lot of consulting through the noughties. It was a rarity for suppliers to challenge decisions yeah. because I, th- I think it was all a bit of a sort of black box and we came out at the end and said, I'm sorry, you didn't win. Uh, and they generally accepted it. And I think now they're more switched on and there's more good procurement lawyers around who'll advise them and go, well, hang on a minute, I don't think that evaluation criteria was quite followed in the right way. And I mean, there was one just last week that came out where where a challenge was upheld um, on on one mark on the evaluation process. And and it was literally somebody getting three out of five versus four out of five on one evaluation criteria. But that, that tipped the balance of who should have won the contract. And I've never seen a judge get involved at that level of detail. No, and I, no. I mean, the judge was correct in what um, what she said, that there probably had been a sort of error made in how they did that marking. But you think, well, if I'm the supplier who's told I'd won and I'm now told I haven't won, I'm going to go back and look at every blooming mark <laughs> on all the other questions yeah, yeah, yeah. and see if I can find a flaw there. So. It's tough being in public procurement. I mean, it always was because it was sort of in the public eye and you had that political dimension. But I, I think it's tougher than than ever. Keen to get your, some of your thoughts on, on procurement. So what important truth about procurement do very few people agree with you on? All right. I think most, most people feel that things like supplier relationship management, capturing innovation from suppliers and doing all the, the procurement with purpose stuff we, we've touched on around you know, mm. emissions and, and uh, human rights risks and all of that. They tend to segment companies starting from how much do we spend with them. Right. And and that's the wrong way of doing it, basically. Yeah. Um, they don't think hard enough about what they're actually trying to achieve and where the opportunity or risk might come from in their supply base. So if you look at the positive side of it, capturing innovation, um are you more likely to to get some real innovation in what you're buying from your your current huge suppliers or from firms who may be very small suppliers to you or may not be suppliers at all mm. so you know you probably need some more sophisticated ways of looking for innovation equally risk yeah uh, and i remember talking to a good friend of mine who's who's still procurement director at the bbc and um, I know people knock the BBC for various things, but they, they've been leaders in procurement for a long time. Mm. And, uh, and he said they did this analysis of where the real risk to the BBC lay in terms of suppliers. This is more than five years ago. And discovered that one of their, I think, top three risks came from a supplier who was three levels down the supply chain. Wow. And it, and it was a bit of software that sort of powered a bigger system that was managed by a first tier supplier. Yeah, yeah. It was like, well, if there was a problem in that software, uh, the BBC would go off air. Yeah. Mentally. 
And so you ask, okay, well, how resilient is that software? Well, you know, it was written 10 years ago by a guy who's now retired and it's a little company that, that someone else has taken on and nobody else understands how it works. I mean, I'm exaggerating. It mm. probably wasn't quite, quite as bad as that. But it was only because they did a detailed analysis that they came out and said, okay, crikey, that's, you know, that's a bigger risk than anything we've got in, in terms of whole spend categories. Mm. Um, so I think it's getting away from the, the thought that it's my biggest suppliers that need the most attention in terms of opportunity, risk, sustainability, all, all of those things. You've got to think a bit harder about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think, yeah, and, and especially looking at risk and understanding risk is, is something that's very, very difficult. And actually, we, we, tend, that's, we tend to be quite reactive because of that. And actually, the yeah. proactively assessing risk is a really difficult thing because it's, it's obviously yeah. easy to say after something's gone wrong, oh, yeah, yeah. big risk there. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's one of the areas. I mean, the, the biggest change I've seen in the many, many years I've been in procurement actually is, is how technology has just become central to everything we do because when yeah. i'm ashamed to admit it but when when i started you now i didn't have a computer on my desk literally, no, literally. No. Hmm. um i had a calculator that was about as far as it went uh but but i mean actually risk management is one of those areas where technology has just been absolutely invaluable because it was just pretty much impossible to do it in a serious way hmm. until we had the systems to support it um and you still I mean, you you can't do proper risk management on an excel spreadsheet no no, you, no. You, need, you need proper support but there are companies out there now who can do that and similarly if you're tracking sustainability issues and so on uh, as well as all the core purchase to pay and sourcing and spend analytics and so on again i remember the early days of spend analytics where we were building the biggest spreadsheets you've ever seen in yeah. your life and then and then try to analyze what all these these numbers meant yeah um yeah it's quite challenging wasn't it it's got things it come along a long way but uh, and what do you see the the future holding for procurement um in some ways i'm more optimistic than i was probably three or four years ago because i i, I remember doing presentations probably pre-pandemic uh being a bit controversial and saying you know, procurement might disappear mm. because so much would be devolved to the end users, the budget holders, yeah. and so on, and so much would be automated. Um, and I think there is still an element of that. But I think now you can you can define a future role for procurement, which some organisations are already well on the track to, which which isn't about running low value tenders, and it's not no, about no. you know managing the P two P process. All that automated, devolved. Um, but actually, the pandemic and the the uh, global economic and political situation, I think, has emphasised how important these issues around managing key suppliers, having a resilient supply chain, having your finger on the pulse of what's happening in the market, uh, trying to stay one step ahead of the competition, as well as getting the value for money and so on, uh, and all the sustainability issues. If I didn't say that, um, you know, that's emphasised that there's a whole bucket full of work there that that you can't see every production manager, marketing manager, finance manager, whoever the the budget holders and stakeholders are. They that's not their job. No, somebody's going to have to do that in the organisation. So I'm actually more positive about about the future of procurement uh, than I was, um, and all of this stuff. It's the old cliche. I mean, I was president of SIPS almost 20 years ago, and we were talking then about how does procurement get the seat at the top table? And uh, and some people still sort of blather on about that today. Yeah, I was always a bit cynical about that discussion because I sort of felt, well, you know, ultimately, if we do a really, really good, good job personally, then organisations will decide what they want us to do and we'll get more senior, whatever. But um, I, I think now these issues more than ever before do give us an opportunity to be talking about things and doing things that really genuinely interest the the board yeah. uh, and the ultimate board. You know, this is the sort of stuff that's getting written up in annual reports and investors mm. and fund managers are interested in it and they want to know what we're doing about, about supply chain risk and about emissions. So great opportunity for procurement leaders to get on top of that 
and become the real experts. That's one thing I, I, I would say. Um, this isn't this whole procurement with purpose thing. It's really complicated. Almost every topic within that heading is complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so procurement, not everybody in procurement, maybe, but procurement leaders and people who are playing a role in that need to educate themselves. You can't just dabble in this. You've got to, you've got to really understand it. Whether you're looking at issues around deforestation, if you're buying some of those critical materials, whether you, whether you're looking at emissions in the supply chain, whether you're looking at human rights, they're all complicated issues. So you need to become mm. a genuine expert. Uh, otherwise, when you do go and give your presentation to the board, you'll get exposed because someone will know more than you and that will become obvious. So so buy the book and start yeah. your journey to becoming an expert. <laughs> That's it. I mean, there is um, yeah, there's a cyclical element to a lot of this stuff, isn't there? There's uh, There was a book written... Well, it was about purchasing at the time 100 years ago 1922 uh, by Helen Heisel I don't know if you've read that one in there you know it's talking about needing stakeholder engagement uh, and, and actually I took a quote from that book and I put it on LinkedIn and I amended it to make it a little you know so it didn't sound too of the era and I got I got 93 likes because it, it was obviously wow. the modern procurement practitioner is a more important person by far than they were in the olden days when a purchasing agent was likely to be a rubber stamp or a bargainer for an extra penny. And yeah. I put that on there and yeah, you know, it still resonates with people a hundred years later. So I think. Well, you, you, you know that. Um, that far, but. Um, Samuel Pepys, the famous mm. Pepys diary. Yeah. yeah. Of London. One of his roles was what we probably now call CPO for the British Navy. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. He, yeah, he was yeah. in charge of, sort of buying supplies for the, for the Navy and, and some of the, I mean, you didn't write that much about it, but some of his comments, you think, yep, same issues today, you know, dodgy <laughs> suppliers and quality of the goods and all this sort of thing. But uh, yeah. Yeah. There's nothing, there's almost nothing totally new in the world, is there? No. So which book has changed your thinking about procurement most? And you're not allowed to say one of your own ones. <laughs> well, no, I probably wouldn't. Um, I, I, I think Professor Andrew Cox and his work on power in the supply chain okay. is some of the most fundamental um, thinking about procurement through my career. Uh, so Business Success is probably his most accessible book. Uh, Andrew didn't, didn't write in a, a manner that made it particularly easy to read and understand what he's going on about, unfortunately. Right. He, he was much better if you went to hear him speak. It, it, was, <laughs> it was clearer. But I think it's a really powerful thinking about that. And then more recently, actually, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, which is not yeah. a human book. I love but but hmm. it's a oh, it's such a great book. And, hmm. and a lot of the stuff in there about priming and our attitudes to risk, you know, every chapter... I read, I thought, oh, that's got an implication for procurement. Mm. And I, I did a workshop on it some years ago with Bravo Solution, as they were then, and their, their sort of customers, um, and did a you know two-hour workshop just based on some of the, the stuff in the Kahneman book and what it meant to procurement. So, I mean, if you haven't read that yet, then it, it's, it's essential reading, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. Brilliant. Well, Peter, thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate you uh, coming along. And it... I'm assuming Procurement with Purpose and um, Bad Buying are available in all good bookstores. Exactly, as they say. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks for having me, Rich.